Hello friends and welcome to our Sabbath School lesson in the Crucible with Christ. My name is James Rafferty and we are in lesson number nine, A Life of Praise. Before we get into our lesson, let's introduce our 3ABN Sabbath School panel. To my left is Jill Marconi. Thank you, Pastor James. I have Monday, which is praying down walls. Amen. And then we have Pastor John Dinsey. It's a blessing to be here. I have Tuesday, the life of praise. Amen. And Amen. Pastor Ryan Day. Amen. I'm excited about Wednesday's lesson, which is entitled, A Witness Who Convicts. And finally, we have Pastor John Lomakang. I'm down here. <laughs> and we have a weapon that conquers. Looking forward to this lesson. Amen. Mm -hmm. So before we get started on our lesson, we want to pause and ask the Holy Spirit to be here with us. I'm going to ask Pastor John Denzi if he would have prayer for us. Sure. Please. Let's pray together. Our wonderful and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, you are great and mm. marvelous. We mm. praise you for your goodness and mercy to us. And Lord, we ask for the blessing of your Holy Spirit. We dare not trust in ourselves, but in you. So we pray that you will speak through us. And we pray that your blessing will be extended to all those that hear this message wherever they may be in this world. And Heavenly Father, help us to learn new things and to praise you for them. In mm -hmm. Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we're starting with Sunday's lesson, or Sabbath actually, a, big bit over, a, big, a bit of an overview of the lesson here. We're going to be looking this week at Philippians chapter 4, 4 through 7. Those are the verses I'll be covering. And we're also looking in Joshua chapter 5, Psalm 145, Acts chapter 16, and 2 Corinthians chapter 20. I love the fact that the lesson quarterly is saturated with the Bible, with the Word of God, because that's what we need. We're going to be looking at praise, a life of praise. You know, sometimes when you think about praise, you think about being happy, you know, oh, praise the Lord. I feel so good today. I'm so happy today. Uh, we're going to be looking at it, at least in my lesson, from a different angle. Angle, and that is the importance of using praise when we're not so happy, <laughs> when things aren't going so well, and tapping in to that power of praise. So the memory text uh, for the lesson for uh, the days that I have is found in Philippians chapter 4. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to open your Bibles there to Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to look at verse 4 specifically. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. It says there, Rejoice mm -hmm. in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Mm -hmm. Now, it's really significant to understand the context in which this is written. Paul, at this point, is in prison. Mm -hmm. He's in jail. He is a prisoner for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is emphasized several times in the context of the book of Philippians chapter 1. He's in bonds for the gospel's sake. And yet he's calling out to his fellow believers to rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice because, because you've got to understand, they understand his context. And so for him to be saying rejoice and then to add the word always, well, wait a minute, this isn't a time to rejoice. You're in prison. We're mourning. We're weeping. We're praying. We're sad. We're no, no, no. Always, always. And again, I just want to emphasize, just in case you didn't understand what I was saying, I was actually, actually saying rejoice. I was saying rejoice. I want you to do it always, even when you're in circumstances that are dire, that are not so great. And I want to say that again. I want to repeat that again, just to make it crystal clear. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So the author goes on to say, it's always easy to shout with joy to the Lord when we feel joy. <laughs> it's not so easy, however, when things are bad when we are at or in the worst situation imaginable, when the crucible heats up. Yet, it is precisely then that we yeah. need, perhaps more than ever, to praise God, good. Mm -hmm. right? For praise is a means of helping us mm -hmm. to sustain faith. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the author goes on to say, praise can transform even our darkest circumstances. Maybe not in the sense of it's changing the facts around us, but in the sense that it can change us and those around us in a way that helps us to face our challenges. Praise is faith in action. It may not always be natural to us, but when we practice praise so that it becomes a natural part of our lives, it has power both to convert us and to conquer. So it impacts us and it, and it impacts those around us. So this week at a glance, some questions that are asked here in the quarterly. What is praise? And how could praise be a powerful spiritual weapon in difficult circumstances? That's good. And then how can praise transform us and the situation around us, right? So we're going to be looking at some of those questions. That's the framework 
for praise. And that's Sunday's lesson, the framework for praise. Basically, we want to look at praise as a power that we can tap into and not a happy flight of feelings that, that we get when everything's going well. We say, oh yeah. We want to look at praise as something that can be a weapon for us. Mm -hmm. We're going to look in Philippians chapter four. Let's start with verse four where we left off and we'll read all the way through verse seven. Philippians chapter four, if someone has that for me, mm -hmm. let's read Philippians four verses four through seven. Jill, would you like to read that for us? Sure. Thank you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. So when you think about these verses in the context of Paul's surroundings, the quarterly asked, well, how could Paul have written such things when he himself is sitting in prison, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, in this passage, what are the keys of gaining peace with God? Mm -hmm. So I just went through the passages and just highlighted a few points. In verse four, one of the first points that you, re you read here is rejoice. Mm -hmm. Rejoice. I mean, that's the obvious point that Paul has made. I want you to, and, and that word means to be cheerful or calmly happy. And I think there is a difference. You know, sometimes when things are going really well, we're uncommonly happy. That's not a word, of course, but we're just like naturally happy. It just kind of flows out of us. And we do goofy things, you know. Mm -hmm. We act goofy. We sing goofy songs. My wife's, you know, I just make her laugh sometimes when I'm really happy. I'm just like, I'm out of myself. But in circumstances like this, we want to be calmly happy. So there's this atmosphere that we develop where we're saying, you know what? I'm going to be happy in this situation. We're thinking about it. We're, we're purposing to be happy in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's the only way we can actually be happy in a bad circumstance or situation. It has to be in the Lord, not because of the present trial, um, not because of what we're going through or our circumstances, but because of Christ yes. and because we're in Christ. And in Christ, all things work together for good, right? In Christ, we recognize that our names are in the book of life. And that's, of course, the context of Paul's writings here that we should rejoice because our names are written in the book of life. And that, by the way, is verse three of Philippians chapter four. So we started in verse four, but if you go back to verse three, he mentions that, you know, our names are in the book of life. Mm -hmm. And then another word that I think is really significant here is the word always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Mm -hmm. There's a consistency there, right. you know, and consistency is a jewel. Yeah. You know, we go up and we go down and based on our feelings and our emotions, you know, we can feel one way and then we feel another way and maybe the weather is affecting us or maybe the way people relate to us are affecting us. But Paul is laying out a principle for Christian experience here. Rejoice in the Lord always. Be consistent, right? We need the Lord always to guide us and to sustain us so that we can be consistent because He's the source of all we are. He's the source of all that we do. So this is a call to abide in Christ. Mm -hmm. When we abide in Christ, nothing comes to us except through Christ. Right. Everything that comes to us first hits Christ. Christ is surrounding us. We're abiding in Him. So anything that comes toward us Amen. first comes to Christ and Christ decides, hmm, whether or not this is going to be something that can be a blessing to us, a benefit to us, a help to us, and then He'll let us, let it in to us so that we experience it in Him and with Him, and we can trust Him for that. Amen. We can trust Christ for that. And that's the blessing about abiding in Christ. You know, sometimes people say, you know, it's so hard for me to abide in Christ. I'm like, you know, if I'm in an ocean and the waves are coming up and down and, you know, I'm out there swimming and all of a sudden the, the seas get rough. I was at a, a lake once, beautiful lake, uh, Christina Lake in Grand Forks, Canada huge lake, beautiful lake. And it's such a big lake that when a storm hits it, it almost like, you almost feel like you're in an ocean. The waves start coming, you know, in this little boat, and the waves are coming over the front of this boat, and you feel like, whoa, what's gonna happen here? Well, I tell you, when I was in the water and that storm hit, I got in the boat, right? Mm. Because the boat is gonna help protect me from the waves that are coming. The waves are gonna hit the boat, and then of course, I'm gonna be rocked about. And that's what we want. We wanna get in Christ, and we wanna let Him protect mm -hmm. us from the storms and the waves yes. of life. Right? We don't want to be out there floating without Christ. So abiding in Christ is a protection. Abiding in Christ is a safety. Uh, it's not just a duty or a responsibility. It's something that God wants us to have in order to surround us with His presence. And then verse 5, it talks about moderation, which means gentleness. That's the NIV. 
Be gentle. The Lord is at hand. In other words, God wants us to be gentle in the way we interact in trials and situations. Yeah. Because I'll tell you what, being gentle in trying situations can be quite challenging at times. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm so thankful that sometimes when I get a, a trial through an email or through a text message, uh, it's not something that I'm directly facing in person because I can write out my response and I can write out my text and then I can give it to my editor, my wife, and she can read it through. She says, you know, James, I'm not feeling what you're feeling. I'm not going through what you're going through. Let me edit this for you a little bit. You need to take that sentence out, take that word out, change this. Or maybe if my wife's not around, I can just pray about it, or I should anyway, and say, Lord, help me to edit this down by the spirit of grace, right? To respond with gentleness because we're on trial as a witness to the world and those around us. And God wants to use that trial to bring others to Him. And then verse 6, I love this most of all, be anxious about nothing. The word in the King James is careful. It means to actually, the root word means to disunite to mm. disunite, to separate. You know, a lot of times trials separate us. They cause separation in the church. They cause division in the church. They cause disunity in the church. And the reason for that is because we, uh, and, and another, another of the Greek words here is to differ. We differ in our trials. We differ and we separate due to the anxiety. We have fear. We have um, apprehension and it causes division and separation. You've seen a lot of that recently, you know, with some of the different um, crises that we've been experiencing in this country and in the world. There's a lot of division taking place. Why? Because of anxiety, right? Because of fearfulness. And so Paul is encouraging us, don't be anxious about all of that. You know, give that to God in pray, prayer. Uh, pass that burden over to the Lord. And then verse 7, the peace of God shall keep your hearts, right? Mm -hmm. The Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, is our Savior. He's not just our example, but He's there for us. And He can keep our hearts through all of this anxiety, through all of this trial. So again, no, no time to cover everything in this week's lesson, but just wanted to highlight um, a couple of key points that, that the author brings out. He says that, first of all, if we take Paul's writing, uh, what Paul writes literally, there are two critical implications for us. First of all, we are to rejoice always. It must mean that we should be rejoicing even when circumstances do not appear to give grounds for rejoicing. And secondly, if we are to rejoice always, it must also mean that we are going to have to learn to rejoice at times when we do not feel like it. Yes. So we lay our feelings aside and we go by faith. We don't look at our circumstances. We look at, at the Father who is our author and finisher, the author and finisher of that faith that we're exercising. And we step in and through that trial as Paul encourages us to do with rejoicing. In other words, praise is an act of faith. Amen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't feel like praising, sometimes we don't seem like we should praise, but praise becomes an act of faith. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Pastor James. I love that passage in Philippians 4. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautifully done. Thank you. I'm Jill Morricone. I have Monday's lesson, which is praying down walls. And if you don't know where we're going, we're going to Jericho. So turn over in your Bibles to the book of Joshua. We're looking at Joshua 5 and Joshua 6, chapters 5 and 6. We do not have time to read all of that, but we're going to hit some of the high points. You think about the Israelites. When they came out of Egypt, they were in a hard place, were they not? They had the Red Sea in front of them. They had the mountains around them and the Egyptian army behind them. They were in a hard place. Now they've gone through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and they come to a hard place again. Jericho, highly fortified city. God, how in the world are the walls going to fall? How are we going to breach the city? How are we going to get in? And of course, you know the story. They marched one, once daily around the city, six times, uh, six days. For six days, every day they marched around the city. This was carrying the ark. This was with the priests. The soldiers, the warriors marched in silence. And then on the seventh day, mm. they marched seven times around the city. And they shouted and the walls came tumbling down. Mm. I don't know what Jericho experience mm. you are facing. 
I think there's lessons we can learn. So I want to back up before the story actually takes place. We're going to divide the lesson up into two sections. The first is the preparation for the battle, and the second is the keys for victory. Now, the preparation for the battle, when I study Joshua 5, I find three keys to the preparation. Covenant renewal, celebration of the Passover, and a theophany, or an experience with God. And then I look at the keys for victory, which was the preparation, then obedience, and then praise. So let's look at the preparation for battle. We're in Joshua 5, verse 2. This is the covenant renewal. Joshua 5, verse 2. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. Now, wait, wait, wait. does this mean they're being circumcised twice? Mm -hmm. No, it does not mean that. This is a first time circumcision for the second generation that came out of Egypt. If you read verses four through seven, it's very clear that they were all circumcised coming out of Egypt. Mm. But many of those people we know died in the wilderness. And for whatever reason, they had not kept up this rite of circumcision there in the wilderness. We know circumcision marked every male as a son of Abraham and a member of God's covenant keeping family. Mm. It indicated that the people were heirs of the covenant. Circumcision was also a prerequisite for the Passover, which is mm. the second step mm -hmm. in preparation that will be coming. Israel needed to renew their covenantal relationship with God. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Canaan was a covenantal land, was it not? It was the land of promise that had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they could only possess it if they were in covenant relationship with their God. Of course, the outward rite of circumcision merely indicated the circumcision that takes place in the heart. I think of Jeremiah 4, verse 4. The Lord says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Take away the foreskin of your hearts, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. So this indicates the heart work. It was an outward sign, yes, but it indicated the heart work that God wanted to do, that covenant relationship with his people. Romans 2, 29, Paul puts it this way. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, Circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So take away number one. Before going into battle, be right with God. Amen. We Amen. often think we can handle it on our own. Mm. We got this, God. Oh, we can take on Jericho. Mm. No, we can't. Mm -hmm. Before going into battle, be right with God. And that's what was happening with this mm -hmm. covenant renewal. Israel was becoming right again with God. Mm -hmm. Let's look at verse 8. Joshua 5, verse 8. So it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. So this time after the circumcision, when they couldn't go out and fight, they would be more vulnerable to attack, would they not? Mm -hmm. Because they weren't able to fight. It demonstrated their faith in God. Mm. Take away number two, before going into battle, wait on God to work in your heart. Key number one was to be right with God. But many times we think, okay, I'm right. I prayed. Okay, God, will you take my heart? And we run off mm. and we don't wait in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. Wait on God. Don't be hurried. Surrender is a process. Mm. Prayer is a process. Time in his word is a process. Wait on God. Don't just say, okay, God, I'm right with you. I'm rushing into battle. Wait on God mm. before you do. Let's read verse nine. And then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. Mm -hmm. At Gilgal, you could say the years of wilderness wandering, their rejection for their rebellion years before was ended. God rolled away Israel's past guilt. Mm. Takeaway number three, your past does not define your future. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Old things are past, the new has come. So your past, whatever you've done in the past, does not define your future. Now let's look at the second step in preparation, which is the Passover that's celebrated. We're just gonna read one verse, verse 10, Joshua 5 and verse 10. 
the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. Now we know the previous chapter, chapter 4, Israel had erected two stone monuments at the crossing of the Jordan. Now they're erecting two living memorials, circumcision and the Passover. What was Passover a reminder of? A reminder of their deliverance from Egyptian bondage. Takeaway number four, never forget where God brought you from. Mm -hmm. There's a quote I love from Ellen White. It says, we have nothing to fear for the future, mm. except as we forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Yeah. Never forget where God brought you from. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now we have the third step in the preparation, which is the theophany. We won't read it, but it's in verses 13 through 15. And you see Joshua's there by Jericho. I would imagine they've done the circumcision, the covenant renewal. They've celebrated Passover, remembered where God brought them from. And now he's looking at this huge city. God, what's gonna happen? And all of a sudden, a man appears. Mm. And what does Joshua say? Are you for us or against us? Mm. <laughs> This is none other than the pre-incarnate Christ. Jacob wrestled with him by the river. Jake Bach. Mm. J Bach, I guess that's right. J Bach, okay. Mm -hmm. But here he comes to meet Joshua mm. before the taking of the city. Takeaway number five, before going into battle, behold Jesus. Mm -hmm. You see, it's not enough to have your heart right with God. It's not enough to uh, know that your past is forgiven and that guilt is washed away. It's not enough to remember where God brought you from. It is important to behold Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the keys to victory. We have the preparation. That was key number one and we covered that. Uh, the second key is obedience. We're in Joshua 6 verses 3 and 4. God was very specific in how they were to overthrow the city of Jericho. Obedience is important. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. You see, our God is specific. Many times we think we're going to go into battle. Okay, I'm going to prepare, and then I'll do it my way. Mm. I'll do whatever I feel like. God, I'm doing it my way. You know, we often say it doesn't matter what day we worship on. Yes, it does. Our God is specific. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who I marry. Yes, it does. Our God is specific. Mm -hmm. When you are facing your Jericho, mm -hmm. know that it is vitally important not only to prepare, but to walk in obedience to what God's word has laid out in your life, mm -hmm. to walk in obedience to what his spirit is telling you. Amen. Finally, key number three is praise. We have to get to this. Mm. What happened at the end of the seventh trip around on the seventh day? They shouted with a great shout. And the lesson brought out this fact, that that was a shout of praise. It reminds us of Psalm 66. Shout for joy, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. So what happens here? First, they prepared. They were right with God. Then they walked in obedience to what God had said. Now, did the walls fall down through anything they did? Absolutely mm -hmm. not. They praised God. Mm -hmm. They shouted and God stood up and God acted on their behalf and God got the victory. Amen. Amen. Lots of good points there, Jill. Amen. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage and he will strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. Lots of good points. We are studying lesson number nine, A Life of Praise. We're going to take a short break and then be back with Pastor John Denzi. Don't go away. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 abnsabbathschoolpanelcom A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends, and welcome back to our 3BN Sabbath School panel. We are handing over our next study to Pastor John Dancy. Thank you so much, Pastor James. We are now moving into Tuesday's lesson, The Life of Praise. The Life of Praise. And I invite you to uh, get your Bible to see if we can follow along. We're going to be looking into Psalms 145. But before we do this, I'd like to read something from the lesson. 
that brings out a message that we need to consider. It says praise is something that we must practice until it changes from being an activity done at a particular time to an atmosphere mm -hmm. in which we live. Praise shouldn't be so much be a specific act, but a specific way of life mm -hmm. itself. That's good. Very powerful thoughts. Mm -hmm. And now I move to Psalm 29, verse 2, before we go to uh, Psalm 145. It says, Give unto the Lord the glory mm -hmm. due unto His name. Mm -hmm. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Mm -hmm. yeah. In reality, the Lord is worthy of praise. The Lord uh, is worthy of every praise. Mm -hmm. Really, there's no other name under heaven that should be praised. Mm -hmm. uh, we sometimes give praise to people and we bring up people for things they have done. And, uh, you know, this, this is very dangerous for people to praise people. Mm -hmm. It's a very dangerous thing. Their head becomes lifted up mm -hmm. and uh, it leads them to a fall. So praise the Lord. There is glory due to his name. In the uh, manuscript released from 1900, uh, it says this, very, very powerful. Our tongues should be used to express the appreciation in our hearts for God's goodness. Thus God requires us to return to him gratitude offerings. Mm. But this is not the only way in which we are to praise God. We are to praise him by tangible service, by doing all we can to advance the glory of His name, by improving our entrusted talents, we are to offer God thanksgiving. So even by living according to the way God wants us to live, it's a praise mm -hmm. to His name. Mm -hmm. And really we have so much yeah. to praise the Lord for. Mm -hmm. I remember one time many years ago, I've uh, been here a long time at 3ABN. Uh, there was a program on 3ABN and Danny said, uh, we want to hear you praise the Lord. If, uh, tell us what you're thankful for. Tell us something that you want to praise the Lord for. And I was one of the people helping to answer the phone and a man called and he said, what do I have to be thankful for? What do I have to praise the Lord for? Mm -hmm. And the Lord blessed me to say to him, well, are, are you in jail? No. <laughs> uh, so are you in uh, an insane asylum? And he said, no. <laughs> Are you in the hospital? No. I said, so I, you do have some things to be thankful for. Mm -hmm. I guess I do. <laughs> did you get to eat today? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> well, you have some things to be thankful for, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. I didn't think about those things. <laughs> and yes, there are so many things mm -hmm. to be thankful to the Lord for and to Amen. praise His name. Psalm 139 verse 14 says, I will praise mm -hmm. thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We should praise the Lord for the reality that He made us. And not only did He make us and create us, but we were created in His image. Mm. Praise be to God for that. Mm. And so uh, let's go to Psalms 145, beginning verse 1. We'll get as far as we can. Time is limited. I will extol thee, this word extol in the Hebrew is to, uh, to lift on high and to be exalted. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. He is worthy to be blessed and, and really bless the Lord. You, you know, it's, it's interesting. You say, the Lord bless us, but we are also to say bless the Lord. And notice how uh, the psalmist says, every day, I will bless you. It was a way of life. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. Mm -hmm. I remember being in school one time and uh, we were taking a look at a single cell. Mm -hmm. And as we looked in there and they started talking to us about the different parts in the cell and I said, wow, God is amazing. And this little tiny thing that you cannot even see mm. with your, uh, I said they say, with the unaided eye, I was going to say the naked eye, <laughs> the unaided eye, then you see, you say, wait a minute, mm. God has so much creativity mm. that you can see this in nature, mm. that even in this tiny cell that you cannot see without the aid of a microscope, He has beauty and He has uh, 
exact design that is uh, worthy of praise. Mm -hmm. Let's go quickly to verse 4. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Why is that? It's because daily God loads us with benefits. Yeah. Daily God is doing things. And so every generation, every individual has something to praise the Lord for, to tell someone else, hey, praise the Lord. This is what he did for me. Mm. I remember there was a pastor in this area several years ago. And uh, the first time I met him, uh, I went to say hello to him. He says... The first thing he said, God is good, isn't he? Mm -hmm. I said, wow, yes, he is. <laughs> I had to say, yes, he is. And so I saw him weeks later. And, and again, how are you doing? God is good, isn't he? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, he is. And I noticed that this was a way that he greeted people, mm -hmm. set the stage for praising the Lord. Amen. We should praise the Lord. He has, uh, the, we, he has so much to be praised for. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Praise the Lord. Recently, I saw this video of some birds that were carrying something in their mouth and they were by the water and they threw this thing in the water. And I said, why is this bird throwing this thing in the water? Pretty soon, I saw him go in and grab something. He grabbed the fish out of the water. I said, wait a minute, who taught this fish, I mean this bird, to use bait to catch fish? God is amazing. I've seen birds grab a stick and try to dig little insects out of, the, uh, out of a, uh, a log or a, or a rock and say, wait a minute, they're using tools. God is amazing. He is worthy of all praise. And there are more. I've seen animals grab uh, a rock and throw it on an egg to break it. It's, he is amazing. God is amazing, worthy to be praised. 145 verse 6, men shall speak of the might of your awesome mm. acts and I will declare your greatness. So much to, we can say here, they shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. Mm. Praise the Lord for his goodness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. Amen. I'm going to read the next one that is tied to this one. The Lord is good to all mm -hmm. and his tender mercies Amen. are over all his works. Amen. All of us, every single one of us, can praise the Lord for His goodness mm -hmm. and His mercy because His salvation, yeah. the plan of salvation is extended to all. Consider it. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever, whosoever can have eternal life through the Lord. That, that is enough to praise the Lord for eternity because That's of right. His great mercy. I mean, every one of us deserves the wages of sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But God, Christ, has paid the penalty, the wages of sin for us. We have much to be thankful hey. for. And I just want to say, you know, when you consider God, He is a gentleman. You know, I was thinking that... Uh, uh, I remember that everybody has experienced this. You're sleeping in a room. It's nice and dark in there. And suddenly, somebody that doesn't know you're there turns on the lights and, wait, turn off the light. Wait, what, why did you do that? God is so good. Every day, the sun rises gently mm -hmm. upon the world and slowly the light of day comes. And eventually, by noon, the sun is shining in its strength. What if God decided tomorrow... I'm just going to turn on the sun full blast <laughs> all of a sudden so that people will know, hey, <laughs> I've been good to you all these years. I'm letting the sun rise slowly. God is a gentleman mm -hmm. and he cares for us. Mm -hmm. He is so good to each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. uh, verse 10, all your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom mm -hmm. and talk of your power mm -hmm. to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Mm -hmm. So my time is limited. So I want to say to you, uh, get into the daily practice of mm -hmm. looking over things in nature and things that God has done for you. Really, God has blessed you just as I'm speaking. The very breath you took is a gift from God. The, mm -hmm. the fact that your heart is beating is a gift of God. Right. So praise the Lord for life itself and mm -hmm. praise the Lord for he has given you another day. Amen. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, on that note, my name is Ryan Day, and we're going to continue on that theme of praise with Wednesday's lesson entitled, A Witness Who Convicts. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, 
we know the Holy Spirit is the one who ultimately convicts, but yet God can use us. He can use us to be a witness that will bring conviction by what the Holy Spirit's doing through us. It can bring a conviction to those who need Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's what Wednesday's lesson is all about. We're going to find ourselves in Acts chapter 16. So let's go there. Acts chapter 16. Man, I'm excited because this is one of my favorite stories. Yeah. I love this story because I could just imagine, I can picture Paul and Silas in mm -hmm. jail and and, uh, oh man, I'm just, you know, it's a horrible situation to be in, right? To be found in jail at any time. But nonetheless, we're going to learn that Paul and Silas made the best out of their situation. Mm -hmm. And someone came to Jesus because of it. Amen. We're going to start in verse 16, Acts chapter 16, verse 16. It says, Now it happened as we went uh, to prayer that a certain slave girl uh, possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she did this for many days. You know, on one hand, you can say, you know, even the demons recognize when they see <laughs> righteousness, when they know someone's led by the Spirit of God. But in this case, you know, it was kind of done, obviously, she's, she's possessed with the demon. Uh, she's, it's being done in kind of a mock fashion and in an annoying kind of fashion. And it, it kind of annoys Paul. But I just, I just made a note here. You know, the devil doesn't waste his time uh, on the wicked mm -hmm. because he has them right where he wants them to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but the enemy has set his sights on the righteous because they are a threat to the evil. Uh, we, the, the righteous are a threat to his evil agenda. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, he's annoying Paul and Silas. He's going he's gonna to be a thorn in their flesh if all, if all he can. And this, of course, brought to my mind Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, where Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, Jesus says, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So this demon is just, you know, wailing away and, and following Paul and Silas where they're going. And as you, if you continue on in the verse there in uh, verse uh, 18, it says, but Paul greatly annoyed turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. But when her master saw that their, uh, that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. And, you know, it's interesting because Jesus Warn, forewarn the apostles and, the, and the, uh, the disciples of this in Matthew chapter 10. And the message still applies to us today. You might find yourself in a situation where you are representing Jesus. You are being faithful to Jesus. And one of these days, Jesus says, according to Matthew 10, verse 16 to 20, he says, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Mm -hmm. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and scourge you for their, in their synagogues. You will be brought before for governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. I love this. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how you or what you should speak for it will be given you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. I love this. That Paul and Silas in a horrible situation, evil men who have taken them captive, brought them before these magistrates, but God is about to work. God is about to show up and show out <laughs> through these men in a way that's powerful. So let's continue on in verse 22 there in Acts chapter 16. It says, Then the multitudes rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So they're receiving some legit persecution. These men were beat with rods. I could imagine their backs all bloody and cut open and now they're placed in the innermost part of the prison mm -hmm. and you know all because they are representing Christ they are faithful in their in their work and in their characters and in their deeds with Christ and this brought to my attention or brought to my memory uh, a, a quote from Great Controversy page 48 which is a powerful one it says here why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber 
speaking of our time. Mm -hmm. The only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standard and therefore awakens no opposition. Mm -hmm. The religion which is current in our day is not of the pure and holy character which marched, marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. Right. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there is so little vital godliness in the church that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. Let there be a revival of faith and power of the early church and the spirit of persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution mm -hmm. will be rekindled. When you have a genuine faith in Jesus, it's an irritation to the devil and it, it will bring sometimes harm upon God's people, but God will see us through it. God is with right. us through it all as he was with Paul and Silas. So now we continue on. They're in prison, right? Mm -hmm. They're in prison, but notice what happens in verse 25. I love this. Mm -hmm. It says, but at midnight, okay, okay. in the middle of the night, these brothers, you could just imagine, they're sore, they're hurting, they're mm. bleeding, they're, they're dry, itchy wounds are there, just itching and stinging. And, you know, you could just imagine the discomfort that they're experiencing, but they wait till midnight. I love this. <laughs> and, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, mm. and the prisoners were listening to them. I just want to got to make a note here. No matter what our situation is, good or bad, it will never take away the fact that God is worthy of our prayer. Praise and That's worship. Right. I hope that when, I hope that I, I hope I never have to end up in prison. But mm -hmm. if I ever end up in prison, for God's sake, I'm gonna be just like these brothers right here. Everybody in that cell block's gonna hear me praising the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be concert city every day. With Ryan Day ends up in prison because <laughs> God is worthy. God is worthy. He should be praised whether in the good situation or the bad situation. Mm -hmm. He is worthy. Psalm 34:1. I love this. I will bless the Lord yes. at all times. That's right. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I love that. Let's continue on to uh, verse 26. Suddenly, okay, so they're praising God, right? They're, they're praising God, singing and, and just lifting up their voices in the darkest hour of the night. Mm -hmm. And it says in verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake mm -hmm. so that the foundations of the prison were shaken mm. and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. I love yeah. this because of yeah. their witness, because these brothers in the most horrific situation found time to stop and pause and say, you know what? Our God is good and we're going to let everybody in this prison know how good our God is. <laughs> Jesus is in the business of prison breaks. I'm just telling you, he's in the business of prison breaks. <laughs> if we are faithful to him, he will move heaven and earth to see that our fetters are broken and that our chains are loose. Just right. simply surrender to him. I love yeah. Psalm 107, verse 13 through 16. It says, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distress. He Thank brought you. them out of the darkness yeah. of the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. Mm -hmm. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord yeah. for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Yeah. For he has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. There is no chain. There is no prison. There is no prison door. There is no prison cell. There is no gate. There is nothing that is going to prevent God from being there for his people if we will That's stand right. firm for him. Verse 27, 27, let's continue on. Then the keeper of the prison awakened from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Mm. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm mm. for we are, we are all here. Then he called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas and brought them out and mm. said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? This brother had a life changing experience. You could imagine him hearing Paul and Silas's voices echoing throughout the halls at midnight. Mm -hmm. He was probably thinking, man, I wish these brothers would shut up. I'm about to go down there and smack them on the head and tell them to be quiet. But because of all of this happening, because of all that, that the Lord allowed to unfold, now his heart has been humbled. Mm -hmm. Now the scenario has changed. Mm -hmm. He's now looking to Paul and Silas and saying, man, this is a mighty work from your God. What shall I do to be yeah. saved? Because of okay. Paul and Silas's mm -hmm. powerful witness, mm -hmm. it brought conviction upon this brother's heart and also upon his family. And I just I, I've made a note here. God will use you sometimes in the most unlikely circumstances to lead the captive free. Isaiah 42, verse 6 and 7. I 
the Lord have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners mm -hmm. from prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. God wants to use us to bring mm -hmm. conviction upon others, not in, in replacement of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. but because of the Holy Spirit's work in us, mm -hmm. God will allow us to be a light to those who are in darkness. Allow yourself, my friends, to be that beacon of light for Jesus today and never ever cease from praising his holy name. Amen. Wow. wow. Amen. I'm starting to think Ryan's getting excited. Are you a little excited? <laughs> praise God. I'm excited. You know, I believe it's true. Wherever Ryan is, he will praise the Lord. We experienced that in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> we did. There will be a Holy Ghost concert all the time. Thank you for that, Amen. Ryan. Wow, it's been a blessing thus far in mind. Thursday, the weapons that conquer. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3 to 7. And, you know, this is the story of Jehoshaphat facing a huge army. And his immediate response should be an example to us. Mm -hmm. Let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3 to 7. Thank you for that, Ryan. Amen. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. What's the first thing he did? Mm -hmm. Seek the Lord. Mm -hmm. And proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord and from all the cities of Judah. They came to seek the Lord. Notice everyone is coming together because the leader set the pace to seek the Lord. I believe that when the leader sets the pace to seek the Lord, the followers will do the same. Mm -hmm. It says, and from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Verse five, then Jehoshaphat stood in the, in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O oh Lord God, our father, of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? <laughs> and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? What a challenge. And in your hand, is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? What a reminder. Mm -hmm. He's in essence, he's not trying to jar God's memory. He is saying, I know you remember that. Mm -hmm. So you see, when we are overwhelmed by vast armies of thoughts that oppose us, people that dispute us, circumstances that confuse us, situations that stunt us, here is what we should do. Second Chronicles 20 and verse 12. Here's what we should do. And he said, oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Here's my first statement. Never appeal to humanity mm -hmm. for that which can only be done by divinity. Amen. That's good. When we see a vast army approaching, the question is, what is your instinctive reaction? He said, my eyes are upon you. He looked upon the Lord. So the statement is, it's not, what you're, it's not what's happening to you. The question is, where are you looking? Hmm. You notice when the Israelites were being pursued by Pharaoh's army, they looked to the army rather than to the Lord. Mm -hmm. In the very same way, Jehoshaphat said, wait, 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 let's remember what they did and not do that. Let us look to the Lord. Our eyes are on you. Exodus 14, verse 13. Let's go there. And the statement is, stop moving until God removes the opposition. Stop moving until God resolves the circumstance. Mm -hmm. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see again no more forever. Mm -hmm. Some of us cannot stand still. We are faced with anxiety and we keep moving rather than waiting for God to resolve the circumstances. Mm -hmm. If you let God re resolve the circumstances, the anxieties that contend with us will not be our experience. Instead of waiting for God to try to solve our problems, some people exacerbate them by trying to solve the problems for God. But notice 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 17. This is very amazing what, what is being told here to us. We read, you will not need to fight in this battle. I love these two words. This is a great sermon title. Position yourself. Yeah. <laughs> That's a sermon right there. Position yourself. <laughs> Some people are in the wrong position spiritually. Yeah. Some people are in the wrong position in their faith. Some people are in the wrong position mentally. Whatever your position, if it's not in the right place, God's counsel to you is position yourself. Where? Stand still 
and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And when they went out the next day, they realized the victory was not theirs. The victory was really God's. Mm -hmm. You see, God is able to resolve our situation and God is also able to change our position. Mm -hmm. Many are in the wrong position because they fail to put the situation in the hand of the Almighty God. Sometimes God allows circumstances to challenge us, but those circumstances will never defeat us if we follow the instructions of God. Joshua 1 verse 19, here's what they said. And by the way, the Lord didn't say, here's what I suggest. He says, have I not commanded you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, when you are serving God, you can't go to the left or to the right without God being with you because right. God is not following your steps, but the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Mm -hmm. You are following the steps that God outlined, so therefore God is always with you. Joshua 1, nine. That's right, Joshua 1, nine. thank you. Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you? Thank you, James. Mm -hmm. Now we go to Matthew 6 and verse 30. Fear causes intrepidation, and this is often the reason for our concern, but notice how Jesus illustrates and addresses this. He says in Matthew 6, verse 30, now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which mm -hmm. today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, mm -hmm. will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Mm -hmm. I love the fact that God looks at our circumstances. He rebukes our circumstances rather than rebukes us. Yeah. Mm. Here's the evidence, Matthew 8 and verse 26. He says, but he said to them, why are you so fearful? O oh, you of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the wind mm -hmm. and the sea, and there was a great calm. Mm. God rebukes our storms mm. rather than our faith. That's amazing. Yeah. God rebukes our circumstances rather than his children. Here's another one. The weapon that confronts us can be reversed by the weapon that comforts us. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 54 verse 17, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Can we say that together? Yeah. No, weapon no weapon formed against you shall, shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. So what is God saying here? When you are his servant, mm -hmm. don't worry about the weapons formed against you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't worry about the tongues that rise against you. Mm -hmm. Do not worry about those who seek to judge you because in reverse, God will allow your testimony mm -hmm. to be a judgment to those who stand in accusation of, in, in accusation of you. God will give you the words that will cause your enemies to fall back. That's why the 23rd Psalm, verse 4, is so beautiful mm -hmm. in one of our prior lessons, but it fits again here. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They do what? They comfort me. They comfort Amen. me. Mm -hmm. So the writer of the lesson asked the question, what spiritual principles can you find and can apply to your walk with God, mm -hmm. especially in times of trials. Second Chronicles 20, verse 21 and 22. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord right. and who should praise the beauty of holiness. Ryan, you had it right, you had it on the target. Right. Right. As they went out before the army and were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Mm. Now, here it is. When they began to do what, right? Sing, Sing. And, and to praise, the Lord said ambush against the people of Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir, mm -hmm. who came against Judah and they were defeated. Oh, what am I saying, Ryan? Mm -hmm. When we learn how to praise <laughs> right. God in the midst of our trials, God will turn our praise into a triumph. Praise God. That's why he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Why do we need that, friends? Ephesians 6 and verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And when we do that, 
what can we have the assurance of? Romans 8, verse 37, mm. yet in all these things yeah. we are more That's than right. conquerors right. through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, Paul says, <laughs> that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate That's us right. That's right. from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. So here's my statement once again. When you see the vast army, it is not what is happening. It is where are you looking? When you come up against those who stand against you, let the praise go up and the victory come down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trust God. He is the only weapon that will win the victory in our behalf. Amen. 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 Wow. Thank you, Pastor John. I am reminded by Ryan that if I ever get arrested for being a witness for Jesus, I want to, one request, and that's he gets arrested with me so we can <laughs> praise him. <God. laughs> we have a few more minutes now where we're just going to have some closing thoughts. We'll start with Joe Marconi. Thank you. What an incredible lesson. I'm just reminded that praise makes an incredible difference in the life of the Christian. So turn up that music and praise Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we have much to be thankful for and to praise the Lord for. I encourage you to look and see that He has been good to you. Psalm 146 verse 2 says, While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Mm -hmm. You may not feel that way at 12 o'clock midnight when I'm singing, <laughs> Rise and shine and give God the glory. <laughs> oh, we got to praise the Lord. That's what mm -hmm. First Chronicles 16, Amen. verse 8 and 9 says. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the people. Sing to Him. Sing psalms to Him. Talk of His wondrous works. Amen. That's right. And the most powerful weapon is the weapon of praise. Isaiah 54, 17, I must end with this again. No weapon formed against mm -hmm. you shall prosper. Right. And every mm -hmm. tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Why? This is the heritage of the servant of the Lord and their righteousness is from me. Praise his name. Amen. 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 I was, I'm thinking about the book of Daniel. You know, Daniel was praising God in Daniel chapter 2 because he and his friends through prayer had been revealed the dream that the king had and they were going to be delivered from death, from the death decree. And so he was praising the Lord, you know. Right. And then you get to Daniel chapter 6. In Daniel chapter 6, it wasn't prayer that delivered them by revealing the king's dream. It was prayer that delivered Daniel into a lion's den. Mm -hmm. And so because of his prayer, he was going to be receiving the death decree and yet it says in Daniel 6 verse 10 that he went to his room, opened his windows right. and yeah. prayed just like he did beforehand but it also says and praised the Lord. And you know what he's praising the Lord for? Say, now it's my turn to be in that fiery furnace. You know, all my friends got to go through that experience and now I get to go through that experience. And friends, we don't need to be afraid of the fiery furnaces. God is going to be with us and we need to praise him by faith for that. Well, our lesson is all finished. Next week, we're going to be looking at lesson number 10, meekness in the crucible. We look forward to studying with you then. God bless.